Um, just, just one item before we get started. We ask you to submit your questions for Q&A in the Q&A section of Zoom. Questions will be queued in the order received. And with that, let's get go ahead and get started. Um, everyone uses DNS these days, and I'm really excited to introduce our next speakers. Fatima, security engineer at the University of Delaware, responsible for, but not limited to, network traffic monitoring, incident response, threat hunting, and managing the theme. She will be joined by Chase, also from the University of Delaware, who has been involved in research and implementing of various things around network packages for more than 30 years. Please join me in welcoming them to share their findings in DNS that might help every one of you to find more things in there. Thank you so much, Alex, uh, for the kind introduction. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm Farma, and I'm not going to waste uh, too much of time to get into the introduction again. But just quick note that I recently joined um, ESNet as a security engineer in, in Berkeley Lab in, uh, in Berkeley. So uh, it's been eight months now. So that was a little bit of change when I first submitted my introduction to first conference. So jumping right into the talk. Okay, so before I actually uh, go into the research and what we did with the traffic, I would like to introduce you to the basic concept of where exactly we are getting the traffic so that in the mind, you, you know that what are the endpoints that we are tapping or we are monitoring. And when I say that we have looked at these logs, you should kind of like know a little bit of background of whatever network traffic profile looks like at University of Delaware. So this is a very uh, raw and very um, high level diagram view of uh, what the uh, what the border and core routers look like in University of Delaware and, and where exactly we are getting the traffic uh, for our monitoring. So we have 10 gig links, uh, uplinks that connect our water routers and that directly go out, out of the internet. <clears throat> we have two core routers that are the uh, <clears throat> backbone of all the, uh, in the all the remaining core routers uh, uh, underneath them. And that's why we are getting the uh, mirrored traffic from both the routers uh, to our network load balancer. And then that network load balancer balances out the traffic to our uh, monitoring clusters. And one of our monitoring clusters that University of Delaware is a Zeek cluster. So we have four nodes and each node gets like roughly 25% uh, of load balance traffic. And our peaks are uh, around eight GBPS in a very um, busy day, but kind of like we average out with the uh, five GBPS uh, link fluctuation. And each sensor, I was getting the uh, PPS rate, which is packets per second. So each sensor roughly gets 300 to 300,000 packets per second, which is not a lot, uh, but that's kind of like what our network traffic looks like. And as you can see in the in the diagram that the Zeek cluster is primarily there for monitoring the east, uh, monitoring the north-south traffic, which is the traffic that going that is going back and forth from the internet to our uh, university's internal network. So that's what our primarily uh, monitoring system looks like, that it just monitors the north-south traffic. I, that means the traffic that is uh, coming into the university and then the traffic that is going out of the university sub subnets. Okay, so our research problem. So everything started with me analyzing the logs. So I like thread hunting and I like doing the analysis and investigation in the logs and I just keep uh, looking into the logs to see if there is something interesting there. So what we found uh, last year when I was doing the research, uh, I was mainly looking at the dns.log file that Zeek generates, that one of the log files uh, that is very interesting and very heavily generated. So we found out that there are some unique uh, trends and activities that are going in our, in our dns.log file and we wanted to investigate them further that what is going on and why these hosts are doing these kind of weird queries. So uh, we came up with, uh, when we investigated a couple of the um, IP addresses that were doing some kind of like unique activity, we came up with a uh, realization that in our network that, th that there are a lot of hosts and IPs that are doing something um, unconventional with DNS. I mean, it was not malicious, but it was definitely something that, is, that was worth looking at. So we kind of like came up with the two classification techniques of how we can find out those hosts that are using DNS for unconventional purposes. Not malicious, but at least to know what exactly is going on. So uh, we coined the term off label use because that those DNS queries were completely fine. You, you should not block them, but we just thought that th those are looking unique. So we came up with a term called off label use for the services and applications that use DNS for unconventional purposes. And when I say unconventional purposes, that means 
um, not the conventional use of like when we go on the browser and type www.google.com, it resolves to an IP and then our uh, host tries to connect to that IP. That's like a very conventional use of DNS. And that is what primarily DNS was uh, discovered to use for as a directorial service. So the two classification techniques to find out all the hosts that were doing something unique with DNS uh, were uh, these. So the first one was we wanted to find out all the hosts uh, who never utilized the DNS resolution. Like if my machine is just, my, my, if my machine is taking an effort to resolve a domain, to get an IP, but it is not doing anything with that IP, then that is a waste cycle, right? Like why am my machine doing that? So we wanted to investigate all the hosts um, corresponding to that kind of activity. And for that, uh, we will go into the detail of, of each and every technique, uh, of each and every technique that we have right now, the, the two techniques, but just a, um, just a one-liner here that for uh, analyzing that kind of activity, we just chose DNS versus TCP connections and it is very coarse grain finding. It is not very fine grain thing that we map each and every connection, but it's very coarse grain. So that's why in overall, we wanted to look into the statistics of how our DNS connections uh, look like versus TCP connections. And then the second classification technique that we uh, came, up, uh, came up with was uh, we saw and we observed that a lot of IPs that were our host IPs, uh, our client IPs, uh, were using multiple DNS resolvers uh, and internal as well as external. So I wanted to like, um, I want to explain what internal and external is. So when a so host is set up, right? And when a host comes up online, there are two ways it can get an IP. One is the static assignment. And then the second one is the dynamic. And in our university network, a lot of clients and majority of the clients, we are trying to move away from the static assignment. And we are trying to have hosts get all the settings of subnet, gateway, DNS servers from our DHCP servers. So we know that uh, majority of our clients should be using the DHCP settings that are sent to them for connecting to the uh, gateway and for connecting to the internal DNS servers. So it was very interesting to see that some of our clients were connecting to our internal DNS servers that were the, the DNS servers that UB has set up for uh, resolving the outside domains, as well as at the same time, those clients were connecting to the Google's DNS server, like 8.8.8. So we were like that, if somebody has set it as a static, then why they would set it like that, that okay, four servers are like random public servers, and then the two, ser two servers remaining are the uh, UD's internal server. So we wanted to investigate that case as well. So these were the two basic classification techniques we wanted to investigate more to find out what's going on in our DNS traffic. Okay, so going to the details of the first one, which is the hosts that never utilize the DNS resolutions. It was very interesting though. So we just we are just curious to know what exactly are the hosts and why they are doing that. So this is a basic workflow uh, to let you guys know that what we did to find out those IPs. Again, it's a very coarse, coarse grain. So um, just uh, a brief introduction of what we did. So first of all, we, uh, we used our Zeek data and uh, we, there were two sources of data, right? So one was our Zeek data for finding out all the outbound TCP connections. Because remember I showed the diagram that we are exactly we are tapping or monitoring the traffic, it was like not so. And then the second, the, the green, uh, the green uh, box there, which says internal DNS request, those were captured by our DNS servers. So we were collecting all the data into one of the same solutions that we have. So those were the two data, primary data sources for this POC. So we collected, and we get a lot of tons of data. So we collected just one hour worth of statistics. So collect all the TCP connections for one hour and put them into the TCP IP file with just the IPs that are making outbound connections. So all the unique IPs for one hour period of time that were making outbound TCP connections, that was our one bucket. The second IP file that we uh, collected was from our internal DNS servers uh, log file, the queries file. So collect all the IPs that were making the internal they, that were making the DNS request over internal DNS server, and put them in the DNS IPs file, and then compare those IPs for one hour. That do you find anything in common? So there can be three scenarios, right? Like the first one will be you will find a lot of IPs common. So that is a normal behavior that one IP resolved the domain, you saw the DNS request, and then that IP initiated a, initiated a TCP connection to whatever IP. Uh, it it found uh, it got from the DNS servers. The second one was the IPs that were only in TCP IPs. Well, that it could be that uh, they are not using our internal DNS servers. They are using either 
uh, static external DNS servers or they are either using DOH, in which case it will not result in any kind of DNS uh, query that we can see because it will be encrypted. And then the last one that is one of the uh, interesting one that we were looking for was IPs that were only seen in DNS IPs file. That means the IPs are querying our DNS servers and resolving the domains, but they're not using those resolutions. So we wanted to analyze that bucket to see what's going on and why this unusual behavior. And we want and we tag that as like these IPs are doing something off-label use of DNS. Okay, so just a statistical scenario. Everything was done on our um, network traffic, so all the uh, statistics are pretty real. It's not any kind of stub data. So as you can see that the first the first two bars, the TCP IPs and DNS IPs, they are pretty uh, normal that if around 53,000 IPs were found in our um, TCP outbound connections. Uh, around 49,000 were found in our DNS um, internal logs, the unique IPs. When we compared them, majority of them, like almost 90% of them matched. So they were common IPs, which was good that normal activity 90% of the time. There were some IPs that were only doing TCP uh, connections. We didn't see any uh, DNS connections for those IPs. We tagged it as maybe they are using external DNS or DOH for uh, resolution of uh, their TCP connections and domains for their TCP connections. The, the last bar, however, the, uh, the DNS only bar, this was interesting. It was almost uh, 5,000, 6,000 IPs. And that IPs, that list of IPs were only in our DNS IPs file. That means that were the only IPs that were making only DNS requests and we didn't see any kind of TCP connection from those IPs. Okay, so when we uh, analyzed that IP file uh, on, in which we only had IPs that were doing DNS resolution, we found out that majority of IPs, so I started looking into what these DNS queries are, like why these DNS queries are not getting used. So for some IPs, I found that like the first couple of a uh, couple of um, tens of IP, we found that they were using HOLA VPN. And how did we find that? There were a lot of DNS queries for DNS test1.hola.org or SMTP test hola.org. And th those were resolving to some kind of random static IP and that IPs weren't used by the host to connect to anything. So I was like, that, that's interesting. So I did a little bit of research of what this HOLA VPN is. It turns out that if you guys don't know, HOLA VPN is a third party free VPN service. And the reason it is free is because it is pretty intrusive. There are a lot of articles um, available online that you can look up that tells you that there are a lot of concerns of security and privacy with HOLA VPN and they are pretty intrusive. What that means is a client who is downloading HOLA will become a VPN uh, endpoint. And people on the network, they people on that VPN network can actually exit their traffic and proxy their traffic through that endpoint. And that's what makes its VPN free because they are not using their own bandwidth, they are using the, the, the customers or the enterprise bandwidth. And we saw a lot of clients who are using HOLA and without even knowing that they are pretty intrusive and everything is in clear text, all the traffic is in clear text. So what are the implications? So in, in general, if uh, somebody's attacking and if that traffic accidentally um, egresses or exits from a client who is on your network, then that would, that would uh, make it look like that that traffic is coming from your network and it will kind of like hide the actual attacker. And a lot of times enterprises have the firewall policies that are pretty lenient to their internal clients versus the external IP address. So we found it pretty concerning. And uh, what more interesting was out of those 50 systems, a couple of dozen systems were spamming. So I was, I said that, okay, now I got that why it is DNS test because Hola is consistently testing your, their client's internal network connection that how good the network connection is so that they can use that endpoint as an exit node. So I understand that, okay, they are using DNS test to see the, if the client can connect to the DNS. But I was interested to know, and I was curious that why it is connecting and testing SMTP. So I started looking into the SMTP, smtp.log file from Zeek and I found that those IPs were actively spamming like more than 50 or 60 um, clients like hotmail.com, google.com, random, random um, people. 
and they were actively getting blocked by spam house. So if you haven't taken a look into the smtb.log file and if you run Zeek, please take a look at it because if you just uh, search for the word spam house or blog, you will see that if your IPs, internal IPs are doing something bad. So that was the bad thing that out of 50 systems, a dozen were spamming actively our internal network as well as the, the clients that are outside. And unfortunately they, they, unfortunately, they were getting blocked by spam house and there were no notification to us that, hey, by the way, we saw these clients who are spamming, you should do something about it. So we investigated that and then we created a policy saying that we will not allow this third party VPN service on our network and the clients who are using it for just the free purpose should not use it on the university owned computers. And if you're on the university network, you should not be using that. And we actually applied that policy and we got rid of Hola in like, <sighs> it's a long process. It took like a month or two because you have to convince the client and you don't want to annoy people that, okay, you cannot use this free VPN service anymore. So we can't, so that was a good part of, out of it that after doing this research, we came up with a, with a uh, governance policy to not uh, allow any user on the network to run Hola VPN. So this is just a quick slide of how we found or how we detected the uh, IP addresses that we're using Hola. So the, four, the first four are the um, domain names and then the remaining two are the HTTP uh, IOCs. So if you want to check out in your traffic, then you can look for these IOCs. The second use case is the antivirus software. So majority of the people would already know that antivirus are very noisy and they use uh, DNS for a lot of um, interesting purposes. I would like to mention specifically um, Smackify. They use something called Global Threat Intel and it is an online database for their premium users so, they, so that they can connect to the real uh, malware detection or malware analysis database to find out in the real time whether a file that they have opened is malicious or not. The same thing is with Sophos. Um, Sophos uses DNS for Sophos extensible list and it provides similar kind of real time protection to their premium clients. So in McAfee, we found that uh, a lot of queries to McAfee.com were looking very random and weird. And I was like, why these random weird queries and what sense you can make out of it? So it turns out that um, for having a quick conversation, like if I have a question that, hey, this file is bad, you just need to answer it in a black and white scenario, yes or no, right? And what is the um, best protocol to do that, which is like fast and um, it will provide, I would not say reliable service because it is DNS and UDP, but it is, it is fast, right? So they chose DNS. And what it does is in GTI that if you open a file, which is a local file, or if there is a local file residing on the um, client system, if it is bad and there is no signature in the, in the local DAD database that ships with McAfee, the client can query it real time to GTI database. And then the GTI, GTI can provide an answer that, yay, it's suspicious, then quarantine it. And no, it's not suspicious, let it run. So they use DNS for that. And then what information is shared it's an encoded query and that encoded query, the first label in the, in the DNS domain is like the, um, it has encoded uh, version and product information, the file hash, and then some information about operating system or the environment where that file was open. We are still not sure what, this is what McAfee says that they share, we are, we are still not sure what exactly other information is shared. So this is just from the GTI's uh, website. So um, a quick look, the McAfee query looks like that. So the first label you can see it's encoded and that contains the information like the file hash and the fingerprint of the system that is sent to the GTI database uh, with mmcafee.com. The only two responses that we saw from, the, uh, from McAfee's DNS servers for those kind of queries were no error in NX domain. Our hypothesis is uh, that when a client queries that kind of query, and when the no error comes back, it means that the hash was found in the database. And it is like a yes in McAfee's term that yes, we have found this file as bad. The NX domain is um, returned when there is no match for that fingerprint or for that, for that file hash that the host has queried. So it's a no answer from the McAfee. So those were the only two responses but that we saw for those queries. So now what we can do about it, right? Like we know that this activity is going on. We are, we are not able to decode what is sent to the uh, GTI database, we, we tried to plot it and we started plotting it. And then what you can see is like a malware trend. Uh, that means uh, 
if there is something new kind of suspicious files comes around and if you start seeing an uptick in that file uh, from your appliance that you, then it can show you something that oh something bad is going on or there is an outbreak of an attack uh, which has compromised a lot of systems uh, which does not have any uh, local entry in the data or it does not, it not have any signature yet, yet so it's kind of like an unknown attack so this is a trend of all the um, files that we saw going uh, back and forth from our clients to McAfee's DNS. Okay, coming to the classification technique too quickly. So it's the, it, it is pretty, pretty basic. Like uh, we are assuming that our clients should be using DHCP and contacting only our internet DNS, DNS servers, but there can be some IPs that can contact external DNS servers. But there were some IPs who are contacting both internal as well as external. And those were the IPs that we wanted to look into more. So that, that's a quick workflow of uh, hourly construction. DNS external IPs are the uh, IPs that we got from ZClock. DNS internal IPs are the IPs that we got from our internal DNS um, queries log. We compared them, common IPs, unusual behavior, IPs that are only in external are okay because they, they, are, they might be using static uh, assignment. And the IPs that are in the DNS internal IPs are the, are the IPs that are using our own internal DNS servers, which should be normal. Results, uh, as you can see, the majority of the IPs um, found in both the files were the internal only. The external only was very small percentage. So we were like, okay, there are still some clients that are using static assignment. And then there was a bar um, of almost 800, 900 IPs that were using both. So that's the, that's the case we investigated further. Turns out that Bellina OS is uh, an operating system that was running on most of the clients uh, who were doing both the internal as well as external. So quickly, Bellina OS is an operating system uh, that is used for orchestrating and managing the fleets of IOC, uh, IoT devices that you have. It, 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 it makes it easier for the, uh, for the uh, managers of those IoT devices to manage them all at the same time. There is another, there's another a setting in Bellina OS orchestration platform that is called DNS mask. That setting is exclusively used for bypassing the internal DNS server setting for, for, all, the, uh, for the, all the IoT devices. And that was the reason the clients, the POS, the point of sale devices were actually contacting the uh, Google DNS server versus our internal DNS servers for some of the queries that they were doing. And, uh, and the result was that they are bypassing. So IoT devices are pretty naive devices. They don't have been built in security already. You don't want them to bypass your internal DNS firewall because that is the minimum level, layer of protection that you can provide to your IoT devices. And if they are doing that, you will get annoyed, right? That why they are doing that. And those were not trivial IoT devices. Those were the point of sale devices. There are small um, kiosks that university has set up for different kinds of events so that people can go and uh, buy tickets. It is using our, like, they should be PCI compliant, right? It is using credit card information. So a little hack, and if they're bypassing the DNS firewall, we would not be able to um, uh, protect them. So a re result is uh, we checked for the api.balinacloud.com and they all were doing the uh, API call for that cloud. And we uh, found those POC device, POS devices, point of sale devices. We talked to the person who manages them. And then we asked them to turn that setting off. So by default, it is on. So if you guys are using Balina OS, make sure that that setting is off so that your uh, I IoT devices do not bypass your firewall. And the second, again, is Avast. The remaining IPs were doing the queries both to internal as well as external DNS servers. Avast has something called real site protection which kind of like builds an encrypted connection from the uh, client's host to the DNS servers that Avast hosts. And the reason for doing that is they say that they protect the clients from the DNS hijacking. And, but the thing is that all the web browsing traffic goes to their, goes to their DNS uh, servers, but all the remaining application level OS, uh, OS level DNS queries and responses still go through the internal DNS servers. So that was the reason why we were seeing both internal as well as external DNS queries from the clients who were running Avast. Um, Fatima, we have about four minutes left. Okay, sounds good. We are almost done. So, cool. and, the, uh, and the result was uh, we wrote up a script that detects the at least five kinds of um, antivirus solutions because 
Antiviruses are very noisy and you can easily pick them up from your DNS.log file or any other log file that they appear in. So I just created a script and we are we kind of like keep running it constant, constantly. And whenever we see some somebody using a different antivirus that is not recommended by the institution, we just give them a heads up that, hey, we pay for this uh, enterprise level antivirus, you might want to use that. But of course, you cannot force them. Okay, so in conclusion, um, there's a lot of interesting activity that you can find by just looking at the DNS.log file. And just the, the, the main takeaway from this uh, discussion is that not only the malware that uses DNS for the unconventional purposes, but also there are legit applications that unknowingly, well, that knowingly uses DNS for off-label use, but you might not know about them. And if there are some applications that are bypassing your firewall, just like Belina OS, then you should know about them because there are these default settings that are automatically enabled and you need to disable them if you, re if you really want them to be protected by your enterprise level uh, DNS firewall. So that was an inter interesting uh, use case that we investigated with DNS.log file. And with that, I think I have just a minute or two to see if there are any questions. Yeah. Thank you very much, Fatima. Um, there's one question um, for Zeek nodes for analyzing eight gigabits per second at peak. Um, that's a lot of hardware. Um, is the Zeek rules used very CPU intensive? It depends. Uh, our hardware is pretty um, rugged. So I said 300,000 PPS. We have designed our hardware that each box is capable of doing 1 million, 1 million PPS per second, uh, 1 million PPS rate. So they are pretty uh, strong hardware that we use. We do have a lot of custom scripts, but again, every script that you turn on in Zeek comes with a penalty of performance. So make sure that there is a balance. And if you can upgrade, upgrade your hardware to support latest and greatest custom scripts of uh, Zeek that you can run. Cool, thank you. Um, then James asked, um, so if everything is going to be DNS over HTTPS and is not visible, what can we do about that, please? So this everything, so what we have, DNS over HTTPS again is coming, it encrypted, we cannot do anything about it. And that's one of the reasons, right? To protect the confidentiality of the client. Again, if the browser, there are applications that are doing such kind of weird DNS behavior. So it might be a while for them to switch from using DNS to DNS over HTTPS because the reason these applications, legit applications are using DNS is for its fast performance. So it might be a while, I'm not sure whether they are going to do it, do a complete switch, but yeah, that's a, that's a good point. We cannot do anything about it, but it would be interesting to see if these applications also move simultaneously with using DNS over UDP for its fast performance or to DNS over HTTPS, which might be a little slower. And most importantly, browser-based activity like client typing in into the browser, that activity might be more DNS over HTTPS, but not like legit application like McAfee, because it, these interactions are browserless, right? McAfee, Belina OS, they internally do it. There is no induced interaction. So, my, so, so maybe there's, a, there's some time that these applications might take to move away from that model to use DNS over HTTPS and how they're going to do that. So until then, we have happy hunting with our unencrypted DNS. Cool. Um, we have one, one last question. I think we can squeeze that in. Um, Omar commented that interesting research. Um, did you use any specific tool to gather or analyze these information? No, uh, make sure that you have data sources. So no special tool. Uh, again, I said that we uh, converged everything, collected everything in a seam, but even if you don't have the seam, it doesn't matter. If you have your DNS um, log file from, if you're running Z, get that DNS data. And if you're running internal DNS servers, of course you will have that data. You just have to ask for it. So no special tool, um, just used Zeek for collecting our north-south traffic and use internal DNS logs. Cool. So with that, thank you very much Fatima Katten for, for giving this presentation. I think it's a great example of sharing research with the, with the incident response community. So thank you for that. Um, and I think with that, handing back to Josh. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.